Another month, another video. This time I'm going to be talking about the Dell XPS 17. It's pretty late right now, especially now that both Intel and Nvidia have released new stuff, so this will probably be refreshed relatively soon. And for that reason, I think it makes more sense to talk about this laptop's strengths and its use cases rather than whether it's worth it or not. If big changes in the GPU are coming out, it doesn't really matter whether this one is worth it or not because it's going to be way better in just a couple months. So that sets the context for this video. I'm going to go through each individual aspect of this laptop and then I'll compare it to a couple other laptops for different use cases. The build quality is exceptionally good, and I want to compare it to the MacBook Pros because it's a little bit different in its purpose. I think MacBooks are built like luxury products where everything looks and feels very expensive, which they achieve with the bead blasted aluminum. The XPS laptops are built to be strong and practical, so things like the soft touch finish on the interior that feels like silicone makes it more comfortable to use and also acts as somewhat of an insulator so the surface doesn't feel as hot under load compared to bare metal. The hinge tension is tuned basically perfectly. It's got very little screen wobble if you're buying the touchscreen model, but still able to be opened with one hand, but not really because there's no groove for you to get any leverage to open the screen. The magnets basically require you to use both hands to open the screen when fully closed. Once you open it like half an inch, then you can open it all the way with one hand. Most of the exterior is bead blasted and anodized aluminum, but the rear of the laptop uses a brushed finish, so there's a bit of an inconsistency there in terms of aesthetics. But other than that, I think it's one of the most well-made laptops on the market currently. It's using the same keyboard as the 13 and 15 inch XPS laptops right now, which have been completely changed since the previous model, the 2019 models. This keyboard I would describe as being quite soft overall, so the tactile bump is not very strong and the bottom out is also cushioned quite a bit. You can imagine it sort of like having a layer of silicone beneath the switch, it's like cushioned. This is not necessarily a bad thing because some people may prefer a softer and more comfortable typing experience rather than something that blasts your hands with tactile feedback. I personally prefer something softer, but just like with the vast majority of laptop keyboards, the shallow key travel makes it not very enjoyable to type on, for me personally. I wouldn't classify it as bad, but I will say that if they gave this like 3 millimeters of key travel, I would probably classify this as being one of only 5 genuinely good laptop keyboards. But also keep in mind that I'm a keyboard enthusiast with a collection worth more than multiple Mac Pros, so if I say it's decent, then it's probably going to be perfectly fine for most people. I would say if your job consists primarily of typing, like a developer, programmer, and you don't want to use an external keyboard, then get a ThinkPad. Otherwise, this is one of the better laptop keyboards that I've seen. It's not great, but I would say it's perfectly fine if you've never used like a 2012 MacBook Pro or a ThinkPad, because those really set the bar. The trackpad on this is kind of a meme with how large it is. I haven't experienced any issues with palm rejection on any laptop ever, so the extra real estate for gestures is something I personally appreciate. Tracking accuracy is really good, both quick and small movements, and with directional accuracy. You can position your cursor exactly where you want it, and do it consistently. It's like one of two or three Windows trackpads where I have that level of confidence in its accuracy. The click is also dampened, meaning it feels soft and cushioned, which also makes it significantly quieter compared to the 2019 XPS laptops. Just like with the XPS 15, the screen is easily the highlight feature of this laptop. The particular unit that I'm reviewing comes with a 4K touchscreen, which is not what I would personally recommend. When I reviewed the XPS 15, I reviewed it with a 1080p panel and it looked really good. It also measured really well too, and when I read NotebookCheck.com's review of this laptop, the XPS 17, they actually had reviews of both the 1080p and 4K display. And according to their measurements, the 1080p panel was substantially better in every category except for the Adobe RGB color gamut, but that's very infrequently used. I would recommend most people, including content creators, to opt for the 1080p panel instead. You'll also get better battery life, you won't have to deal with reflections, you won't have any scaling issues in Windows, and I think it's like $400 cheaper. As far as the 4K panel that I have with my unit, the measurements are good but not outstanding. The only class leading aspects are the contrast ratio and the color gamut. If you do opt for the 4K panel, it seems to only be for touchscreen and HDR support, so it doesn't look very compelling given the additional $400 that you pay on top of an already excellent display. 
The speakers on this are actually quite good. I was impressed by how nice they sound, particularly in the bass response and the tuning of the frequency response. Vocals sound natural on these speakers, which is something that some of the gaming laptops with good bass response completely failed at, and that made them mediocre in how they sounded. These also fire upwards from the left and right side of the keyboard. Uh, there's not a whole lot to complain about, and I think they sound really good. On the left and right, you'll find four Thunderbolt 3 ports, one full-size SD, and one headphone jack. The whole deal with like USB-C adapters aside, the thing that bugs me most is that the position of the right USB-C ports actually interferes with my mouse if I use an adapter that extends out with a cable. This could easily have been resolved by swapping the position of the SD slot with the USB-C ports, but uh, I don't know, I guess they just never noticed this for some reason. In terms of performance, the hardware it's running is pretty standard for a gaming laptop in 2020, but the question is whether the cooling is good enough to sustain that performance for long periods of time. The answer is no, it can't. I am happy to say that the fans run nice and fast, and that the temperatures are quite good, but the temperatures are only good because they're capping the power limit of the CPU and the GPU. I assume part of that is because the charger is only 130 watts compared to 180 watts that you'll find on most gaming laptops with an RTX 2060. So there's quite literally not enough power to feed the laptop without draining the battery while plugged in. But then when you see stuff like 68 degrees on the GPU when you're stressing just the GPU at 65 watts, you're losing a lot of performance despite having plenty of thermal and power headroom. And this is with the high performance thermal profile enabled, this is not stock. When you put this side by side with a properly cooled 15 inch laptop with the same specs, the gaming laptop pushes out much higher frame rates. But whether that lost performance is critical to your workflow, and more important than all the other good parts of this laptop, like the screen, that's obviously up to the individual person to decide. Not everyone's a gamer, and this is less of an issue if you're a photographer, for example. Inside, it's running a 97 watt hour battery, which pushes out around seven hours of light use, which I didn't expect but other reviews seem to report similar numbers, so if you want to make it through a full 8 hour workday, get the 1080p panel instead and you should get 9 hours pretty comfortably. Around 2 months ago, I reviewed the XPS 15 9500, which was essentially this laptop but smaller. To summarize that video, I basically said that it became a lot better in some areas compared to its predecessor, but was substantially worse in others, so I felt that it was a laptop that was a master of one, rather than a jack of all trades. I found that it did exceptionally well in content creation and media consumption, but the very short key travel on the keyboard made it not very enjoyable for things like programming or anything where you're typing for extended periods of time something that I personally enjoyed on the previous XPS 15. For those two tasks, maybe look at the Lenovo ThinkPads, they have exceptionally good keyboards. That evaluation of the XPS 15 carries over for the most part to the XPS 17, but the larger form factor means you get the trade portability for a bigger battery, bigger heat pipes and fans for better cooling and better performance, and better speakers. Between the XPS 17 and 15, I would say it comes purely down to portability. If you are a student who actually uses their laptop in random places like coffee shops and libraries, get the 15 inch. If you're just moving this from work and home and it's pretty much always stationary on a desk, that is where I think a 17 inch laptop is ideal. And as an overall laptop, I think they did an excellent job except for the performance. And I think for most people, that's probably going to be the deciding factor. Okay, that is going to wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed it, despite it being kind of outdated at this point in time. You know, as a small channel, I don't really get to pick what laptops I review. And uh, that is it. I will see you next time in a month. Probably, hopefully.